Hello everybody, this is Miranda the Hybrid, and welcome to Art Talk Thursday. Now today we do have a lot of stuff to go through. In fact, so many different subjects that I wrote all of them down. Today is branding day. Now branding is very important if you want to become an artist who sells your work online or frankly start a business in general. Heck, my mom who is an author was asking about branding just earlier today. And well, let's get to it. <laughs> There's a lot we gotta cover. I'm going to try keeping this video under 30 minutes. No guarantees. So first things first, your brand is your promise to your customer. Who are you? What are you here for? What are you offering? Who do you want the public to perceive you to be? Those are the very first things you should be thinking about. I know some people, especially you artists, are like, oh, let me, let me get my color palettes. I want to come up with a logo. No, that's not the first thing we're going to do. First thing is we're going to be developing a brand identity. You also have to think of who your audience is. Who are you trying to sell to? Appealing to 18 year olds is vastly different than appealing to like, I don't know, 45 year olds. Completely different demographic, completely different interests, even different design language. So we're gonna break this down into three steps. I want you to grab a pen and pencil because you might have to do some writing or these days, I guess it would be a laptop or tablet or a phone. First, we're gonna go through the thought building, the basis deciding essentially who you are and who you want to be. That got deep. The second part of this is going to be the physical branding. And I know the artists are like, whoa, at this. Yes, we're going to be figuring out color palettes and logos and stuff. And the third part is going to be the habit building. And we'll talk about that later. That gets a bit tedious and it's what you sometimes pay other people to do for you. But if you are a poor nobody like me, then it's like, oh, wow, I got to do all this work on my own. Wow, having a brand is expensive and difficult and ah. So you got your pens ready or your itty bitty thumbs striking your itty bitty phone super duper quickly. So as I said before, your brand is your promise to your client. Let's use me as an example answer. In fact, I'll be using myself as an example because until we get to the big companies, I can't really point out any smaller ones. My promise to my audience is that I will be teaching them art things that are usually only brought in college. I will be simplifying it and I will be making it readable and understandable for everybody. I will also bring a small amount of humor and be a creative artist who spits out random crap once in a while. And most of all, I want to be kind of relatable. Somebody said I was having difficulty figuring out what I am and lots of people said that I'm relatable. So I guess that's one of my identifiers. Apart from being a teacher, I'm a relatable teacher, which is actually really good for me. Second thing we have to do. When people hear your name, Think of several words you want to pop into their head. For me, it would be creative, relatable, and knowledgeable. For you, it might be creative, stylistic, and speedy. I don't want you to do anything with those words right now. Put them in a little bag and we're gonna get to that later. And finally, if you could summarize your goals to your client, if they were just standing right in front of you, what would they be? That is called your mission statement. And if you go to any big company, they're going to have their mission statement somewhere online. Now I know you might just be a 16 year old wanting to sell your sketches online, but it's kind of important for you to start thinking about this stuff. My mission statement, for instance, is to create very creative works that appeal to a wide audience while also teaching young people who wouldn't usually have access to the level of education I want to give them. I want to create a vibrant, peaceful and safe community for all artists of all ages and all medias. And most of all, I want people to love and believe in themselves. I want to teach them that mistakes are okay. It's part of growth. And in the end, they're a lot more better and a lot more loved than they think they are. That's my mission statement. Okay. Now that we have all the heavy stuff done, let's jump into logos. This is part two of our conjuring of branding. This is the physical part. So we're done with one part and we're bringing in another. First, we've got to choose our color palette. Now, I know a bunch of people might want to go like red and black or white and black, or I, I don't know. One problem with anything that's white and black right now, it's, it's a minimalist movement. Right now, we are going through a movement of minimalism. The biggest culprit is Apple. 
They are super duper minimalistic and because their brand has a lot of value, other people try copying that so that they can be correlated with Apple's branding. Apple is one of the best branding companies I've ever seen. Their products aren't as good as people think they are. I'm not saying they're bad, but like, when people think of Apple, they hold it on a super duper high pedestal or they loathe it. It seems to be one or the other. Realistically, Apple has extremely good branding, which brings it value, which means it can sell itself for a lot more money. Same thing with places like Starbucks or Lush. Coca-Cola has done the same thing and quite well. When you think Coca-Cola, you think of the swirly letters and you think of the red and the white immediately. They have their branding on point. It's also why they can demand more money for a product that's basically the same as the store-bought brand. Before we choose colors though, we actually need to understand color because colors have meaning. They have direct meaning. Look at the color language used in basically any Disney film, for instance. Now we're gonna be talking about Western color design language because Eastern color design language is different. It actually has different meanings for different colors. Now think of when you go into an Apple store or a Best Buy, what shirt colors are those people wearing? Blue. Blue is correlated with professionalism and confidence. You can even see this in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Leonardo wore a blue band and he was the leader. Blue is also pretty much correlated with technology. So if you want to be professional, if you want to be maybe a bit high tech, like if you're starting a business for coding or fixing computers, I'd very much suggest you use blue somewhere in your color language. Next we have green. There are so many different companies that use green and for different reasons. In Western culture, green can mean money and we're only gonna, we are only going over the positive ones because there are negative connotations for different colors. But when you're making a brand, you obviously don't want negative connotations. So let's just think about the positive ones. So green, money, health, eco-friendly. I believe there's something called acorns in Fiverr or Fiverr or something and Cash App. I believe all of those have green, like their entire app logo is green. Upwork used to be the same way. You see a lot of healthy based companies using green too, because you know, green plants, you know, easy, easy correlation there. And also healthy, happy, a lot of money. Green's just generally a very fruitful color. It's a very positive, luscious, happy color. Now think of yellow. Anytime you walk into a McDonald's, there's yellow and red all around you. Now think of the logos for like, I don't know, Chick-fil-A, Burger King, Basically, come up with a list of fast food companies. You're gonna see that a significant portion of them have either yellow, red, or both in their logo. And that is because that's a very, very food-based color. It's the color of bread, of corn, of red meat, of fruits. There have been studies done. If you're sitting near warm colors or in a room that's decorated with warm colors, you'll actually eat more. That's why a lot of restaurants have warm tones on the inside. It's literally psychologically tricking you into eating more. Now, I'm pretty sure that an artist won't need to use those two colors, but yellow is also linked to positivity, happy feelings, psychological health, especially yellow and orange. Psychological health is big on those two. Think of Bumble. Bumble's logo is yellow. Once we start moving into red, we're starting to get into more passionate colors. For instance, a red sports car, a lady in a red dress, Tinder. Tinder's logo is a kind of reddish pink, almost kind of magenta. It can also be used to signal war, violence, anger, danger. This is actually a completely evolutionary thing and it's kind of funny for this reason. I believe it's orangutans. When they're in mating, their butts get super duper red. Or it's baboons, not orangutans. Their butts get super duper red. It's the color of blood. It's the color of, oh, I'm ready if you know what I mean. We still have part of that instinct in our head. Red, blood, baboon butts. It's all linked back there. So that's why red is a color you see in lots of sexy commercials. Red lips on a lady. The red sports car is considered the sexy sports car. You also see red on teams and you expect them to be slightly more aggressive because red can be more of a sexual positive love thing or it can be a more of a wartime aggressive kind of thing. For instance, in Big Hero 6, when the robot turned bad, his light turned red. Red is a Western color signal for something going bad. We have red flashing lights on police cars. We have red flashing lights in the hallways whenever a fire goes on. Red is an extremely diverse color. So if you're gonna use it, be careful because it could mean different things to different people, especially with different colors.
If you put red and white and blue together, for instance, you get the United States or a bunch of other political places. But I think the United States has been very red, white, and blue for a while. If you put red and black together, you get kind of danger evil zone. And that's because black is knowledge, sophistication, and power, and a bit sinister, because black is the color of darkness, and darkness is when we can't really see anything. And that leads to, unner you know, just being a bit nervous. That's why in Star Wars, Darth Vader wore black. That's why Darth Maul, one of the prime bad guys, was red and black. And bad guys in Star Wars have red lightsabers most of the time. See, everything is linking together. I'm teaching you guys basic color theory. <laughs> Black is also, as I said, business, sophistication. You see the Lincoln cars. Most of the time they're black. Rolls Royces, black. Suits, black. A lot of different business attire, black. Black is a very powerful and versatile color, just like red. When they're paired together, typically they're seen as negative in Western culture. In Eastern culture, black is actually a positive color, and usually white is the color of the bad guys. For instance, if you look at Bleach, the Shinigami wear black robes, but Aizen, the bad guy, has a white body, and the Hollows, the bad creatures, are white. So it's flip-flopped in Eastern culture. But in Western culture, which is the one we're talking about right now, white is seen as purity, it's seen as simplicity, cleanliness. Unfortunately, racism has a lot to do with this. It's also the modern color of technology, and that's where I want to jump into teal. Teal is one of those special colors that's becoming a lot more concurrent, and you can look in my background right now. I've branded myself with teal in a lot of my videos, even my symbol. It's teal. Teal is the color of future, technology, mystery. This you see it in you see it in like Tron, you see it in computer boards even. Like if I pointed my screen over to my computer, half the components in there are glowing teal and not by my design. So if you think about it, the teal combined with the white, combined with the black, those are my three colors. Teal, white, and black. What does that mean? What do you perceive that to be as? Especially with my design language, the more futuristic, runic-looking language, letters, whatever you want to call them, that I developed. Like, if you look at the Miranda the Hybrid logo, look at the style I've developed. I have made an entire... This is called design language. I developed an entire design language specifically for my branding. And if you noticed, it goes hand in hand with the Perantana logo. Hmm, I wonder why I did all of that. I wonder why it looks so similar. Branding! The last color I want to touch up on is purple. Purple is one of those kind of can bounce back and forth. It's a bit like in the orange spectrum. It has lots of different meanings, but purple is magic, entertainment, royalty. And let me tell you why it's royalty. Purple is considered a royal color because it used to be an extremely expensive ink way back when in like the Renaissance or whatever. Making purple or blue dyes, that's why we have the color royal blue. It's because purple and blue colors for painting or pigmenting or anything really, dyeing clothes, until indigo was discovered, was very, very difficult to come by. You essentially had to crush up precious gemstones to get those colors, which is why we have royal purple and royal blue and thusly the connotation, which has continued into the modern era, that purple is a royal color. It's very rich, it's very elegant. Gray is an industrial color. It can also be seen as kind of apathetic and cold, so I might not use gray unless you want to use it with blue or turquoise, so that's becoming an actual area, like, wow, I'm very techy, look at my turquoise blue and gray, I fix computers, like something like that, that would work. But if you're using like gray and red, which I know a lot of sports companies use, if oh, don't even get me started on like the over masculinity that's present in sports design, it's ridiculous. Like everything has to be this edgy gray and black. We are men, we're powerful, we're apathetic. Think of that, a lot of male clothing, is gray and black when it comes to sports. Power, apathy, and emotionlessness. See? Color design is extremely powerful. Which is also why... Okay, here's a funny thing about pink. Pink used to be a man color. Pink used to be a man color because way back when, men would wear red and then it would wear out and they would pass it down and the boys would be wearing the pink of their father's clothing because it literally just used to be red and it would lift up. And girls used to wear blue. 
So that's why in Cinderella, Cinderella started out with a pink dress, but then when she went to her ball, it was a blue dress that's considered more feminine back then. But of course it's flip-flopped and now we have hypergenderism or whatever you want to call it, which is extremely unhealthy for everything. Don't get me started. But pink is seen as a bubbly, happy, unfortunately girly color. If you move into more deep pinks like magenta, you're looking into sexy, fragrant, fruitful, flowery, powerful. Anything in the super saturated is going to be seen as high fashion and powerful. They're very, 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 very complicated color palettes. I'm just trying to give you guys the basic ones. So now that you have your color language, you better have written all that down because I'm not repeating it. You can also just rewind the video. I want you to think of those three words you came up with earlier. Now, I want you to take those three words and see if you can come up with the colors that correlate with them. And you might just have started figuring out the color palette you should use for your brand. See, not so hard. Step two of part two, logos. Now there's something I have to say about logos. They gotta be simple, they gotta be recognizable. What you're looking at is sometimes, I think on average people don't look at your stuff for more than like two or three seconds. You need something that will be memorable. For instance, look at me again. That's pretty darn memorable if I don't say so myself. It's pretty unique. There's not many other things like it on the market. Somebody said The Legend of Zelda looked a bit similar, but I mean, at least that's correlating me with fantasy, which is what I want to be correlated with. So that's a bonus on my end. And the final thing I need to say about the logo before I go into the history of logos and all that stuff, it needs to work in black and white. I had a client, I was designing a logo for her photography business. This is a while ago before I'd really figured out the entire client thing. And I was trying to come up with something unique and elegant, something that would work really well, something that involved the letters of her name and making it just feel good, making it feel elegant, high class and recognizable. She ended up dumping me and trying not to pay me. And she came up with something that looked like rainbow clip art of an old fashioned camera. It was not memorable. It did not look professional. She's going to get breezed by by so many different people because she did not have a good logo. Now let's think of some very famous logos. When I think logo, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is Apple. And then we have things like Nike, McDonald's, Starbucks, Wendy's. And of course you start going into apps, there are tons of really, really, really recognizable app logos such as Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. What do you notice about all of these sitting next to each other? They're very recognizable and quite unique and simple. I know it might be tempting to make a really complicated, cool looking logo, but frankly, if you do that, you're gonna be one in, you know, one in hundred, you know, one in hundreds of thousands who do the exact same thing, and you're just gonna fade backwards and not get recognized. You need simplicity. What you also may notice is that these logos are all blocks of color. If you turn them black and white, for instance, they would retain their recognizability. Now there are some logos that are just words, such as Amazon, FedEx, PNC Bank. They still work though, even in black and white. It really helps that they're literally just saying their name as their logo, but I digress. Another thing I want to talk about, and this will be more of a concern for artists, especially because I know we all pick up a bunch of different products or projects, is cross-branding. Now, I'll give you a good example. We're talking about somebody at my level, you know, somebody who's starting to make it, but we're not like, like Aaron Blaze or something yet. So here's my Miranda the Hybrid logo, right? Here's the Parantana logo. You might notice that they have a very similar design language. You might also notice my consistent use of teal, white, and black. Consistency. I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get to consistency later. Consistency, creating a design language for yourself is extremely important in cross branding. When you make multiple projects, you want them to be recognizable as yours. You want people who already know you to be able to be like, "Hey, that's that person's. I recognize their, you know, I recognize their style. I recognize what they're doing with it." That's very important, especially because more than ever in the history of our species, 
we are creating so much content. So you at least need to make sure that your content stands out and it's recognizable through different projects. And that's where the consistency of design language comes in. I had a bit of a boost because I've been literally coming up with outfits since I was like four or five, but you get the idea. I'm sure you guys can do it. Sorry that I've been playing with this. I just, this is a lot of information for me to say all at once and I'm trying to do it in a concise manner. And so being able to fidget with this is helping me think. So now we're done with the physical bit. We're on to the last one. This one should be pretty easy to get to. These are the habits that you build and how you present yourself. First thing I want you to think of, what is your product? What are you bringing to the table? Are you making extremely special furry drawings? Do you have a very nice, unique style? Are you hand carving tigers with rainbow patterns on their back? You need to make sure you know what you're selling because that's gonna tie into your branding, your mission statement, everything. The second thing you have to think about is your advertising. This is my least favorite part of running a business. I hate advertising. It feels like you're kind of nosing your way into people's lives and saying, hey, I have a thing, huh? please pay attention to it. And that's one of the reasons you have to make advertising fun. There is a ratio, a kind of golden ratio when it comes to advertising. For instance, I actually use Instagram to advertise. Lots of people, especially younger people, use, advertise, uh, use Instagram as a gallery. Don't use Instagram as a gallery use it to publish your work and say, hey, I have something going on. If you want to have a gallery, go make a gallery on art station or something. It's a lot more friendly to work through and to find things in. Instagram is not a friendly platform for trying to find things in a gallery setting. So when you advertise, especially when using Instagram, you want to have two to three fun posts that have nothing to do with your product and then one advertising post. Me, for instance, I will post two to three different posts over a period of a week about pictures of my art, sketchbook tour, something. And then one of the posts will be advertising a video coming up. That means that you're still giving people entertaining things that they signed up for, but you're also on occasion reminding them that you do have things that you want them to go look at. You do have projects, you do have products. If you consistently advertise, you're gonna drive people away. There are some big artists who I unsubscribed from on Instagram because they annoyed the heck out of me with constant advertising, especially in a world where literally everybody is tracking you and, you know, YouTube has ads pop up. And if you search for a microwave on one website, you're going to get microwave for the next 20 websites in the next three weeks and you can't get rid of it. Yeah, you don't want your favorite artist consistently throwing their own product in your face. Consistency is also good when it comes to advertising. For me, I have the YouTube channel. You guys know that you're getting three things a week and I branded them already. Tutorial Tuesday, Art Talk Thursday, Art Block Friday. That was all a branding scheme. Sorry. It also sticks in your head though, because it's an alliteration. Art Talk Thursday, Tutorial Tuesday. Plus it's actually just what I wanted to do anyhow. It just happened to rhyme and it happens to be memorable, but it is a branding. That was, I literally sat down and thought, what can I call these different videos that will make them memorable? And when should I put them so that people know what time they'll come back? Those three posts I make, these three videos a week, are in themselves an advertisement for themselves. Clever, right? But yes, having a social media presence is important. Also communicating with other artists is important. That's something I'm bad at. I really feel weird reaching out to another artist and saying, hey there, uh, wanna, wanna work together and then post it so we can advertise for each other? It does feel awkward, but you know what? You're gonna have to do it. And don't be afraid to reach out to slightly larger artists than yourself. I mean, don't go after somebody with like 5 million followers because they just, they're literally, their inbox is literally so full that they'll never get to you. But you know, somebody with a few thousand followers. The, like for instance, I don't get that many messages on Instagram. So if somebody decides to reach out to me over Instagram, most of the time I get to see it and I'll look and I'll say, oh, hi, they're doing something. Hmm, let me answer. And of course, I said this before, schedule. If you're posting videos, make sure they come out consistently. People like consistency. They like reliability. They like knowing that their favorite show is going to be on every Saturday night. That schedule and consistency will help you. By the way, the golden rule of advertising and branding is consistency. Consistency is also visual. I'm gonna use myself as an example again, just because I know what I'm doing. 
If you look at the beginning of all of my chapters of the webtoon so far... Yes, another one's coming soon. Please, please, please hold up your pants. You'll notice that they all begin with the same thing, and then the number's just below it. Look at that. Bam, 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 bam. Very, very, very similar branding over and over and over again. This is literally just the way I'm branding the Perantina series. It makes it easy. It makes people expect, they, they're expecting it. When they open this webtoon, they know they're gonna scroll down, they're gonna get that really cool outer space with the white cool runic letters on it, then rolling into the story. That's called priming your customer for something. You're priming people, you're setting their expectations. It's literally getting their mind ready for whatever you're about to give them. It's one of the reasons that I start with, hello everybody and have the little logo up here. I'm literally priming you guys for my video. It's all psychology. One of the final things you have to worry about is making yourself memorable. There's so many products out there. There's so many artists. You could easily get lost in the fuzz. And a lot of you do because you just don't know how to put yourself out there yet, which is why we're making this video. Taglines are very, very useful. I'm gonna say a few taglines and you're probably going to be able to answer. Just do it. What company is that? Or what about Red Robin? Yum. Red Robin was part of the literal title there, so it's fine. Or what about the snack that smiles back? Yeah, see, 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 it's all in there. Those taglines, those little jingles, those are meant to get stuck in your head. Certain YouTubers have the same thing going for them. If you think about Jack Septica, he has top of the morning to you laddies. He did that for a very long time. Uh, for those of you who are old enough, Tabuscus went like, Hello, once again, audience. He went like that. And I remember that still to this day, like a decade later after watching his videos. And what about, have you noticed what I'm doing? At the end of each video, I go, drink your water, get your sleep, believe in yourself, and chase your dreams. That's so you guys can remember me. It's honestly what I want you to do. I want you to drink your water, get your sleep, believe in yourself, and chase your dreams. But it's also branding me as a very friendly, caring person, which I am. And it's also memorable. It's something that I do at the end of every single video. Now, a way to brand yourself if you have physical art is, of course, something like a logo, at the bottom right corner, your signature. If you want to put your logo, as many do, at the bottom of their pictures, then you can. In fact, that will wrap your entire brand together a lot better. Now there are bad ways to make yourself memorable. And let's look at one of those. What about all the different insurance companies? There are some insurance companies that do extremely well. For instance, Mayhem, like me. This guy's one of my favorites. Then Flo, who I find repulsive and annoying, but memorable. And then of course, everybody's favorite little lizard. These are successful campaigns. Now there are dozens and dozens and dozens of unsuccessful insurance campaigns. You've probably watched them on the television and have forgotten about them just because they didn't stick out well enough in your mind. You do not want to be like those forgotten insurance commercials. You want to be like Mayhem. You want to be like Geico. The reason that they're memorable is because they're either relatable or they're a very good character and it really helped the image of the brand. So let's summarize this a bit because this has been a giant wad of information. Make sure you know who you are and how you want others to perceive you. To perceive you like that, you have to act out what you want to do. You can't just say, I wanna be a really nice person and then act like an asshole, that's not gonna work. You have to act in a way that will get people to perceive you and keep coming back. That's called brand loyalty there. That's why Apple people keep buying Apple products over and over again or why Starbucks people always go to Starbucks. Frankly, there are better places that have better coffee, but the Starbucks place has like a freaking cult. It's because of that brand loyalty and what people perceives that, like the view of people have of themselves when they go to that brand. In fact, you could say that people who go to Starbucks and use Apple products might perceive themselves as a bit higher class. Subconsciously, they don't want to actively admit it, but that's the image that Starbucks and Apple give out white upper middle class. Of course, I'm pretty sure you guys, you just want to get people to buy your sketches. So we're not even gonna go there. You need to stop using really complicated usernames. Cut out those ridiculous like 
underscores and double quotes all over the place. If people can't find your username, they can't find your art. You're not memorable. It's not unique. I'm sorry. I know there, there's probably some 14 year olds out there and they're like, wait, you mean my underscore underscore XXX flying horsey 15 rainbows 99933 XXX underscore underscore exclamation point. You mean nobody's going to remember it? No, nobody's going to remember that. There's a reason I'm just hybrid Miranda or Miranda the hybrid. Miranda and hybrid. If you put that into the SEO of search engines, I pop up pretty darn quickly. Make your name simple and also make sure that they're consistent throughout all your different social media. That's why on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube, on Webtoon, I'm always hybrid Miranda or Miranda the hybrid. In fact, my YouTube name is the only one that diverges. It's the only one that's hybrid Miranda and that irritates me because I want brand consistency. So make your social media tags consistent. Make it easy to remember. Seriously, cut out the underscores and consistency. Brand yourself by doing the same thing over and over again. I have my tagline at the end of the video. I have that same goofy kind of song that I put at every single end of the video. I have, you know, I'm starting to put the other one in the upper right corner. You can even look down at the way I label my videos. I label them in a way that's easy to remember. It's all about consistency. It's about making it easy to remember for people. Everybody has so much stuff going on in their heads all the time. It's hard to remember somebody unless they're simple. That is a very, very, very short version of the beginning of the basics of branding. I'm not even going to go into advertising because I have not figured it out myself. Advertising is a cesspool of blah. But seriously, if this video helped you, if this is helping you get things started, get the ball rolling, give me a subscribe. And if you know other artists that this video would help, just send it on over to them. Down below, the first link is actually to a very good article on branding. This video is more interactive. This is more of a reader's thing where you can sit down and get the nitty gritty details. And as per usual, I'm using an empty glass this time because I drank everything while I was shouting at you guys. <laughs> drink your water, even if it's invisible. Get your sleep. Believe in yourself. Seriously do, you can do it. And chase your dreams. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye bye